All right, we just, I love this series, Applying the Word of God. You know, a lot of people really don't understand that it's so important to apply the Word of God. How many here know that the devils believe in God? Satan believes in God. I mean, he, God made him Lucifer before he fell, and then he became an old split toe and a slew foot. He became something that God did not make him. He was a, a light creature, but he fell. Okay, and as he fell, he became a fallen one. So he became darkness. God is light, and in God there is no darkness at all. Come on on in, sis. Grab some notes and scoot on in. Wave at the camera. We love you. <laughs> it's okay. I love to tease you. You can always, you know, tease me back, you know. Okay, so so tonight we're, we're learning how to, in this series, how to apply the Word of God in practical things, how to apply it in our life. What do we do under certain circumstances? You know, there are a lot of Christians are looking for answers. Can you say amen? So tonight is rightly dividing the word. Did you know there's a right way to divide it and there's a wrong way to divide it? A lot of times Christians just kind of, because they don't, maybe they don't study or maybe they don't understand, they just put the whole word into a big package in case a rock or raw, you know. And that's just not the way God wants us to understand. Let's, let's find out what he really wants. So in this lesson, follow along in our, in our paragraph there. In this lesson, we will show how to rightly divide the word of God. So as we know the difference between truth and the religious ideas of man. Okay. Remember, truth is called doctrine. And religious ideas of man's called dogma. Everyone say dogma. Roof. Okay. All right. So that's a basic lie else worth. Man's opinion. Okay. And man's opinion can be wrong, but God's word is right. Can you say amen? So many good Christians will still stumble in their understanding of the word, not having enough solid truth to back what they actually say they believe. So God help. Help me to write this lesson to help others and even even people that are searching for answers. God, through his word of God, and he gives us a picture of his plan for mankind. How many know that God has a good plan for us and not a bad plan? I got the hiccup, so that's why I'm kind of, <laughs> you know, hiccuping, all right? So God helped me put this lesson together, all right? So God, through his word, gives us a picture of of his plan for mankind. We all know what words are for. They are to convey something to another, right? Could you imagine what it was like in the beginning? After the Tower of Babel? <laughs> Could you imagine? What they were used to is understanding one another's language. And all of a sudden, their languages were confounded. And I might hold up something you call a glass... But the per very next person next to me might call it a woo you know? And now conversations all cut down. Now, the Bible says that when that happened, man scattered and began to build their own uh, civilizations and communities around what they understood to be their language. Remember, everything changed. So we need to understand that God has given us language and words as carriers. Now I know I, I parted away from that a little bit. Words carry pictures. Words carry songs. Words can carry anger. Words can carry love. So words are capsules. Everyone say a capsule. That has the gospel. It's the gospel capsules. So. If you're a good speaker, and every one of you are good, a good speaker is not one that uses fancy words, is one who can convey what they understand to another with very little differentiation. In other words, remember the circle when everybody, you know, in those parties, somebody will start off with a simple story and they'll tell one person and that person will think about it and they'll turn around and tell the next person and then turn around and tell the next person, turn around how that conversation or that little idea has changed by the time it gets around. 
Well, God does not appreciate mankind changing his word. Did you know in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, there is a curse for those who take and change the word of God? And so there are also plagues added to those who add to the word of God. Well, you see, well, Pastor Kerry, why is that in there? To warn us that God's word is forever settled in heaven. Do not alter its meaning. Let its meaning pour over you and alter your life around what it means and says to you. Say amen. So, like for example, a word, I'm, I'm going to go back to our paragraph. If I say love, if you close your eyes and I say love and those coming in by camera, all of us are going to have a picture of love, but not the same picture. But once we use words correctly, like God does, we can define the picture and focus the picture down to God's love or human love. Or here's one for you, Amanda, puppy love. <laughs> you know, she loves dogs. So. But just use that one. You follow what I'm saying? So each word describes a picture. So let's go back to our paragraph. So God, through his word, gives us a picture of his plan for mankind. It's good. It's positive. It's encouraging. I pray that this lesson will open our eyes to, to know how to discern good teaching from bad and to give us the wisdom and the understanding to eat the hay and spit out the sticks. Can you say amen? I am convinced that it is God's will for us to know him through his word and also spending time with him. How many know we need both? We need to spend time with him. We need time in his word. Amen. All right. So go with me to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 14 through 16. I'm going to read from the Amplified Version. Normally I use King James but I wanted to start out with this version because it brings out a couple of fine points that we need to kind of understand. So 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 14 through 16. In the Amplified Version, it says, Remind the people of these facts and solemnly charge them in the presence of the Lord to avoid petty controversies and conversations over words which do no good but upset and undermine the faith of the hearers. In other words, don't get into arguments. Don't bring up wife tales. Don't talk about things that are really not that important. Amen? Especially in front of people who want to know the word. You know, I always try to say this. If it's my opinion, I try to say it's my opinion. If this is my conviction, which means I, it's not quite the word, but I really believe it's saying this to me, then you know it's not the word word, but it's what I'm getting from the word. Say, so I try to describe that. Okay, same thing here. Now, listen. Study and be eager to do the utmost to present yourself to God approved. How? By testing by testing by trial, a workman who has not cause, no cause to be ashamed, correctly analyzing and accurately dividing, rightly handling and skillfully teaching the word of truth. Now, so one of the things my pastor taught me years ago, if I was going to share the word of God, I have to share it the way in which it's meant to be shared. In love. Can you say the Amen. It's to be supposed to be shared to encourage the hearer. The only time Jesus got down on anybody is in Matthew 20, 22, the end of it, and 23, where he's getting down on the religious people. Called them whited sepulchers, you know. He, the religious people in the temple where he overturned the money changers. God does not like religion. He wants his people to know the truth. And we know that there's been a spiritual outlaw hiding people from the truth for our entire history. You know, Lucifer, oh, split toe, you know, Klingon, the dude. He's running around trying to keep people ignorant. Paul's constantly saying, be not ignorant of the truth. Be not ignorant of the gifts. Be not ignorant of these truths, my brethren. Of the coming of the Lord, be not ignorant. And yet, 
The serpent doesn't want us to know. But we're going to teach you tonight how to rightly divide the word of God. And you'll have fun doing it too. Everyone say, yeah. So do you know how to discern a conversation if somebody's really telling you the truth or not? Oh, everybody has their science. Number one, if somebody has to force a truth on you, it's usually they, they have another motive. So nobody needs to force the truth on you. Just present the truth. Now, we should love God enough to go after the truth. It says to hunger and thirst after righteousness, correct? All right. Also motive. If people are sharing the truth to coerce you to make a decision is not correct either. You can't catch Jesus doing that. He says, I've set before you life and death. He suggests you choose life that you and your, your children may live. <laughs> but he didn't say, you better choose life or else. That's under the law. Can you say amen? And you and I are under grace. Say grace. She's a fine lady. All right. <laughs> All right, so let's move on. Grace, the gift of God to us, something we didn't deserve. Okay, continue on. So we need to be able, who's sharing the word, to handle the word properly, do it out of the right motive, to speak up to the people and not down. You get the idea, right? Okay, so let's look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 through 17. All right, the two testaments. How many testaments do we have? What's another name for testament? Covenant. What's another name for a testament covenant? Contract. Very good. All right, all of those will fit. We, we know a covenant because the covenant is the cutting where blood flows. Jesus shed his blood to cut a covenant between heaven and earth. Jesus representing man, the Father representing Jesus being the mediator, being God and man, he could put the covenant together. Now, how many know that God cannot be defeated? Jesus wasn't defeated when he was here on earth. So by two immutable or unchangeable or absolutely perfect things, a covenant was cut, blood was shed, and you and I were told, if we have faith in God, you get the covenant. So look at somebody say, when you put your faith in God's word... And believe in Christ, you have a covenant given by God. And no matter what you do, you can't mess that covenant up. You don't have to say that part. I'm telling you that. No matter what you do, you can't mess it up. See, in the Old Testament, they messed up the covenant. Because the covenant in the Old Testament had flaws. The flaw was man. We were constantly breaking our word to God. And every t time we did, God would have to forgive and make another covenant. What do you think the priesthood was all about? Hello. Every year, the covenant would be reminded, the shedding of blood, the forgiveness of sin. Hello. But aren't you glad it says Jesus entered in once and for all for us? Cutting a covenant between the Father and between mankind, him representing mankind, representing the Father. He is now the mediator and the advocate of the New Testament. So he sees everything that he put into operation is ours. Now there's a problem. How's anybody going to know what's ours if nobody tells anybody? That's why God gave his word. How many, how many is going to hear about healing if nobody teaches or shares that there's healing for you? How many here get, get, get saved if nobody tells you there's salvation for you and how to be saved? You see, so the word of God is very, very, very valuable. Now, here's the problem. We live in a society, and I'm not blaming anyone, that we value only what we think we should value instead of what God says we should value. It's kind of like the person that knows they can do it, but should they? Just because you can doesn't mean you should. So you just don't balance. So the word gives us that understanding. The word should be valued. Okay, so let me quote why. We know the scripture, then we'll go back to Timothy. And that is in 1 John, it says, excuse me, in John 1, it says, in the beginning was the word. the word. 
So you notice it didn't say, and I'm not trying to make a doctrine out of it, but for people who are smart, think about this. In the beginning, it didn't say there was Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It says in the beginning, there was the Father, Word, and Holy Spirit. Hello? But, you know, young Christians say, oh, no, he was always the Son of God. Well, then when did uh, uh, the father have a mother who had a baby God? You see how dumb that is? No, he was the Father, the Word, and the Spirit. Three in one, one in three. Say amen, somebody. And if you read this, and the Word became flesh, the Word became flesh. So in the beginning was the Word, the was with God, and the Word was. So if the Word was God, how should we value God? So when you open your Bible, do you tremble? Do you shake? Hoping that you're not going to misinterpret this? That you're going to get the right message from God? That's how you should handle your Bible. But most people just toss it down and carry it around. And they do all that because they can think it's a book. And it is. It's the logos. It's the written word of God. But the written word of God and your spirit with the help of the Holy Spirit comes alive when the word is handled with great respect. Handled with great respect. The old ministers used to say, and God bless the reading of your word and make it, you know, good in the ears of the hearer. But we seem through society, and I'm not faulting anyone, that the word is taken like third place. We got God. Oh, I love God. But do you fall down and on the Bible and cry out, I love God's word? It's the same thing. Now, if you don't believe me, I know it's an eye opener. But Psalms, the 119 chapters, all on the word. And there's several places in there. It says, and I will worship your word. You couldn't make a statement like that if the word wasn't God. Do you understand? So you need, when you open the pages of that word, you're opening the heart of God. And when you look into the words, hopefully you're smart enough to be in the New Testament first. And you let those words be the heart of God speaking to you. The Holy Spirit will ignite them and make them alive. And you'll get revelation come into your understanding Faster than you can write it down. Because God is a spirit. The word is spiritually understood. It's only foolish to the natural man. But it says in 1 Corinthians 2. That it's spiritually understood. So when we apply that with great respect. Great reverence. And we lift the word up. It comes alive. It becomes a treasure, a living treasure, speaking to you. Now, if you don't get that when you read your Bible, let's start again and get that. <laughs> My pastor showed us. He showed us so living. Put your hand on it. I saw five or six people just touch it and were healed. As he once he described through words what the Bible actually is, it's not a book. It's living God material. It's the essence of God's presence. And when you speak it, when you think it, and when you see it, it's living and it's full of power. Paul even said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of God, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Romans 1.16. Are you still with me? All right, 2 Timothy it says in verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 14, but you must continue in the things which you have learned and have been assured of, knowing upon whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures. See, he was well-versed in the Old Testament, and, and that's the scriptures they, ha they had. They didn't have the New Testament. Remember, they're writing it. And it says, which are able to make you what? 
make you what? Wise. Wise. If you're going to be wise, speak the word, not your head. Okay? It helps not to do that. Okay? To make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Now listen. All scripture is given by inspiration of God is profitable. All scripture is profitable. Get it? All scripture is profitable. Uh, Proverbs, it says that scripture is medicine. It's the balm of Gilead. He sent forth his word and it healed them. Psalms 107 verse 20. Amen. The word is healing. The word is Jesus. The word is God. You put the word on somebody, you're putting God on somebody. You let the word on somebody, you're talking God on somebody. Can you say amen? You're not trying to convince them God. You're speaking God. And we've got to get that idea. You're not trying to get healed. You were healed 2,000 years ago. Now appropriate that healing through the word of God, speaking it, believing in your heart, speaking with your mouth. The word is so very important. That not one thing was created without the word of God. Not one thing. All things were made by him, and through him was not one thing that was made that was made. In him, in his word, all things are held together. So the more words you get in it, the more your life gets held together. Can you say, man, it's like glue. Let's get the super glue. Let's get the gorilla glue. Spread it all around. Can you say, man? So all scriptures given by inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine, teaching, for reproof. Reproof means correcting a bad idea unto a good idea. In other words, the, the light is red. Stop. Instead of the bad idea, go right through it. <laughs> okay. For reproof, it doesn't mean, reproof doesn't mean rebuke. For correction. Everyone say correction. Here's where Christians are missing. You're not asking God to correct you and help you. We, we, we think correction. I know that when my son said this to me, which says, Dad, why is it when you, 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 you're, you're sharing things with me, I always feel like I'm getting lectured. It's because you're taught if anybody tries to teach you something that's important, the enemy teaches you that it's a lecturing, and it's not a lecturing. It's an instruction in righteousness. In other words, do this, paddle. Don't do that, good. It's a lesson in righteousness. Can you say amen? A lot of times, though, kids will think that when you tell them something to do, they think it's attack. You say, I'm a leader. If, if you don't know how to do it and what it is supposed to be done, I'm not going to tell you, hey, guess. Go ahead and take a guess at it. Well, no. <laughs> God says to all of us, take a guess how to get saved. He gives us his word. Right? If you don't know what is meant, ask, what do you mean by that? Okay, get some clarification. If you, here's the thing God loves. If you don't quite get what God is saying to you through the scripture, say, God, can you clarify that to me? Try that. He loves to. And he'll show you for 15 different angles what he's trying to tell you. Why? Because he'd rather have us get it in his word than have us learn it through bad circumstances. I'd rather miss a few potholes by somebody pointing a sign, go right. Oh, you said it wrong. You hurt my feelings. Yeah, but you still have your A-frame, dude. <laughs> People, <laughs> oh, you hurt my feelings. Listen, if it's a fire, I'm going to kick your body out of here. And it might hurt while I do it, but you're going to be saved. You understand? People, <laughs> we've gotten all prissy when it comes to the word. Don't talk to me that way. I'm going to leave. Please go home and pray. Amen. So, I mean, it, it's really tough to lead anything if you can't get the sailors to head the mainsail. You know what I mean? <laughs> All right, let's go on. Of course, we can here. Everybody's doing great. So, look at this. Why are there two testaments? Can you tell me? The Old Testament had some flaws. Can you tell me what some of those might be? 
Everyone point your finger at yourself. <laughs> First flaw, man, we're full of sin, right? So the Old Testament was put together. Can anybody tell me why the law? What's the simple answer of God, why God gave the law? Yes, that's right, BJ. Because the law shows us that we can't save ourselves. As good as you are, Sherry, and as, as wonderful as you are, when we try to measure up to God, how many know we fall short? So it's just wise enough to say, you know, I can't measure up to you, God. And God says, I'm not expecting you to. I'm expecting to reach down, take my hand, I'll hand you up. Well, oh, we're too proud. I don't want to grab your hand. Your hand's too holy. <laughs> I don't want to bother God. You're not in the Word. See, that's man's religion. Do you know the Word of God will cut away man's religion? And will show you how to have a wonderful relationship with God. Number two, testaments. Um, testament means covenant, contract, you know. It's also something the most powerful thing. Point three, the Old Testament pointed to the New Testament. It's the old, the, the old Testament is the New Testament's hidden. And in the New Testament, the Old Testament's meaning is revealed. So in the Old Testament, the New Testament is a mystery. That's why people didn't understand God dwelling in them. But in the New Testament, the things that were the types and the shadows and the little things kind of lean to something greater is revealed in the New Testament in Christ. Can you say amen? God had revealed them unto us by his spirit. Amen. So, God wants us to know in the New Testament and not to guess like the Old Testament. Everybody was guessing. I hope God's not mad at me today. Remember Gideon puts out the cloth. If it rains on here by next, tomorrow. And then he says, that's not good enough. Let's see if it, if it doesn't rain. <laughs> Try that in Washington, Gideon. You know, all this testing and all this unsurety. We don't fight as one beats the air. In the New Testament, we walk with God. God walks in us. We move, we live, we dwell with God. Now we need to know his word so we understand what we got when we got saved. Say amen. Somebody said somebody died and left you a trillion dollars in stocks and bonds. But you don't know what a stock and bond is. What would you do? You would talk to somebody who does. You would find out how you get your hands on those stocks and bonds. What's the best way to handle those stocks and bonds? Why do you think God gave you the word? He gave you it in Old Testament form to let you see why they had such problems, why God had to bring Messiah out. He gives us the New Testament and he says, now you walk with me, you be filled with me. Let me anoint you. I'll give you the angels, my name, my covenant. I'll give you my blood. I'll carry you. I'll follow you. I'll do everything for you. Just don't listen to that liar out there. And in order to stop doing that, you've got to know the word good enough. To be able to answer the lies. When Satan came to Jesus. How did Jesus answer? Man shall not live by bread alone. But by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Amen. That's what you live by. It's the foundation of your feet. All right. Fourthly. The Old Testament was about the plan to rescue mankind. How's the plan looking so far? Good. All right. In the Old Testament, God seemed... Harsh, but in the New Testament, he seems to be about love and rescue. What's the difference, Pastor Kerry? We'll get to that in a minute. When we try to get our teaching just from the Old Testament, what's wrong with that? It was flawed. Very good. And, and one of the flaws was God wasn't indwelling in man. Could you imagine? How many times we heard in the Old Testament how God wanted to come and dwell with man? It's the old word tabernacle with man. Amen. And we see God coming through covenants. And then all of a sudden, we see God having Moses erect a box where God could actually come and dwell in the box in a temple. And a temple that they can move through the wilderness. 
What's that a type and shadow of? God being in our temple. Wherever we go in the valley of the shadow of death, in the wilderness of the fallen world, God is with us. He's in our boat. But how do we get reassured of all that? Because our mind wants to doubt. The word of God was written to our soul to bring refreshing, to anchor it to the truth. Can you say amen? And then when we try to get our teaching from the Old Testament, we're missing, like BG said, some pieces, Jesus, that are satisfied. And now listen, we're to study the whole scripture. But when you're reading Old Testament, remember they didn't know God intimately. Only Abraham and a few people knew God intimately. And that's because God needed them to do some things in the earth that continue to bring forth a Messiah. So he took people and changed them by visiting and re appealing to them. But they had at least first call out to God. How about the church today? We think we've got it together. Now, but we act like it because we live in a we live in a good country. This is a good country. Let's just take all the man's messes away and look at the good God put us in. He put in some great things, but we can rest assured sometimes and lean on what we have and re not realize we're still without some great things that we need to have in fruition in our life. What I mean is there are some things we know that are ours, but we need them working in our life. And in order to get the things to work in our life, like to get God's favor to amplify in our life, we have to consult God's word. How many know we can't be yelling at our husband and expecting our prayers to be answered? Did you know it says in Peter that if you're angry with your husband or angry with people, your prayers are automatically hindered? So why do that? Hey, listen, you're right. Go ahead. You're right. I'm not just please, you're right. Now I want to pray and I'll be heard. Oh, bless God. A thing they used to the devil used to do to me is used to get my mind away from the word and dwelling on what God said onto what people do. How I many you know if you dwell on what people do, it's happy sometimes, not so happy. Next. How much do we actually dwell on what people do as versus the dwell on what the word says? Now, don't feel bad, but let's kind of make a little analyzation. I could be sitting there and enjoy a good session with God, and suddenly my mind will hear a little thought, and I could just follow that thought in my mind. <laughs> that doesn't mean you're terrible. Just control it. Say, hey, man. Poke your neighbor and say, he's talking about himself. I know he is. All right. So listen to this. In Hebrews chapter 8, okay, verses 6 and 7, it says, But now he has obtained, talking about Jesus, a more excellent ministry, insomuch that he's a mediator of a better covenant. See, Jesus mediates the new covenant, which was established on better promises. Where do we see those promises? In his word. Amen. For the first covenant, had it been faultless, there would no place been sought for the second. So there you go. You'll have people that'll tell you, oh, yeah, you're going to read the whole, you're just throwing away the law. You study the history first, and then you'll understand Jesus. Listen, understand Jesus first, okay? Because the history will mess you up <laughs> until you understand Jesus first. He's your eyeglasses. How many here has ever needed a time where you found you needed readers? Your eyes got a little weak, and then you needed some glasses to help. Well, Jesus, listen to me. Jesus is our, your readers. You look through life at friends, at people, through Jesus' love. You look at Scripture in the Old Testament through Jesus' focus. Can you say amen? amen? You look at through Jesus. When people say things to you, you look and you listen through Jesus. Okay? Hear what they're saying, but don't take offense if they're hurting and they make you hurt while they're saying it. Instead, be mature enough to say, hmm, I heard what they say. This is it. I'll pray. You see? Oh, we're so reactant. You know? Are you the kind of person who goes to eat a good restaurant then afterwards picks it apart even though it was really good? You got a problem. 
Don't pick things apart. Pick yourself apart. Have God re put you back together. Everyone, do this again. God, pick me apart. Put me back together. If you have to do it three times a day, do. Nothing wrong with that prayer. He's not going to hurt you. But he certainly will get a lot of you out of the way, which is the problem. Okay, moving right along. <laughs> Listen to what Galatians 3, 19 to 26 says. What purpose then does the law serve? It was added because of the Jewish transgressions. Tell the seed, Christ, should come to whom the promises were made. And it was appointed through angels by the hand of a mediator, Moses. Now, a mediator does not mediate for one only. It's between two. But God is one. It's either God or nothing. Can you say amen? I mean, know that God's always right. He's perfect, isn't he? Now, one thing you need to realize in understanding the word of God, if your understanding doesn't measure up to the perfection of God, then you're misunderstanding something. I'll say it again. If your understanding of the word <clears throat> doesn't line up with the perfection of God, then we're missing something in our understanding. Got it? Which is okay. <clears throat> the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Wait a minute. God gave me that. Why would he want to take it from me? See, we're missing the understanding. The Lord gives you life and takes away your sin. So sometimes we need to look at what's being said a little longer and not assume shallowly. Right? Say amen. So now it goes on further to say, verse 22, but the scripture has confined all under sin that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Do you believe? Amen. But before faith came, we were kept under a guard by the law. Kept for the faith which should afterwards be revealed. The New Testament in Christ. Therefore, the law was our tutor. Actually, our guard to bring us to Christ. Every time you did something good, the law would say, not good enough. You need Christ. Every time you did something, you were impressed by yourself. It's not good enough. It's a work. The law points you to Christ. You need Christ. Because what was happening? People were like Cain. We we're trying to impress God. Hey, God, I don't want to come to you by faith. I want to show you what I'm doing. Well, if we as Christians in the New Testament start doing things to be seen of men, what does the Bible say? We have our reward. So if you, like for example, if you're a young Christian, you're doing things to impress me and make me happy, stop. You're trying to make God happy and by faith do it. But don't do it for people. Do it for God. And if God says, yeah, go ahead and do it for that person. Now you've got God first and you're doing it for that person because God's having you do it. Now you, you're blessed. But if you go out there and say, hmm, they're mad at me. I'm just going to give them a gift. Did God ask you to do that? No. So what are you doing? You're doing a work. A good work. It's a noble work. But works don't have any power with God. There's an energy that we, by faith, doing things in love for God, for God and others, that is in every action that we do. It's like a little mark. And when we just do a work... But we don't do it because we love them or we love God, but we're just doing it because we have to. There's no life in it. It's called a dead work in Scripture. And this is what the Hebrew people were doing. They were going through the motions and everything like that. And then once they got the temple and everything, all the rites done, they would act like sinners the rest of the week. Why? Because there was no life in them because they weren't born again. Come on, don't lose me here. So if we do things in our own energy, there's no life in it unless God inspires it. Hello? We want God to inspire. He doesn't have to say, wear the blue tie. 
<laughs> no. But if it inspires you to want to go to church with excitement, wear the blue tie. Do it in faith, you see. You're doing it for right reasons. I'm out there working hard in the church because I want to love my God and love people. Amen. I'm out there working hard because I don't want people to see how well I work. I want God to know that I am loving him by working. Working a work follows our faith, never leads our faith. So our work, like an usher or like somebody parks in the parking lot and they're doing it unto God, that's a worship. And they will never lose the reward. That's what the word says. The word says do it for the right reason. Well, when we read our Bible, in order to get something from it, you must approach the word because it's God, humble and in awe. When you do, the Holy Spirit goes, check, enter in, let me show you. Check, enter in, let me reveal to you. Check, let me show you that, and you'll remember it forever. But the way in, you have to have the key. The key is approaching the word with humility, with awe, with great respect, as because it's God. Satan is a master. Remember what he does. He puts everything in a category for us. Yeah, it's a book. And then we start to analyze it in the category. Yep, you're white, you're black, you're red, you're uh, Asian, you're ca ca Caucasian. Everything's in a, a box. No, God doesn't look at us this way. He looks at us as one. How many know, how, how many's ever got a, little, a sliver in your, in your finger? Does your head know it? Why is that? Because it communicates to the head. Are you in the body of Christ? You better let them know the head and the people in charge what you're doing. Otherwise, you're a tard. Okay, not a retard, a tard. You're broken and dysfunctional to the rest of the body. We shouldn't do those things. Can you say amen? And of course, you guys are ace. You never do that. You never do God's things your way. <laughs> All right. Moving right along. The word helps us to analyze our life. How many here know that we need to analyze our life through the word of God? Do you have a time where you and God sit down and go through how you need to straighten up? Let me put it another way. Have you ever sat down with God and have him say, All right, God, work on me and... Uh, how am I doing? And show me some things I need to work on. Most, some people do. Most people don't. Because they think God's harsh. They think God's going to do it the wrong way. No, the, the best thing God wants for us is to be whole. Happy. Full of, of him. So yeah, when he gets over to that, that little bit of sore spot and he touches, it's going to sting a little bit. But he's the healer. Remember when mom used to put the, the disinfectant on you? It stung like all oh, kidding, right? How you flinched and stuff. But you were glad it got, got on there. Sometimes it's a little bit like that. He doesn't hurt us. But the truth is so revealing. We're so, in, we should be so God embarrassed that we fall to our knees and cry out for help. Now you're going somewhere. Why? Because until we come to the end of ourself, we never can go forward. And the word points that out. So let's move right along. All right, what do you say, Pastor Gary? Jesus is the will of God and the word of God. So we need to treat Jesus because the father says, hey, how are you treating my son? Well, it says, if Jesus be lifted up, what, what's the rest of that scripture go? All men will be drawn unto me. So when you lift the word up in your life, what's going to happen? People are going to be drawn to you. They're going to be able to ask you, why are you smiling all the time, Denise? Hey, Mark, why are you smiling? Why, are you got, why do you look so happy? Well, you're in the word. You have a relationship with God. Your sins are forgiven. You can sleep at night. You don't have to look in your rear view mirror and see if the police are falling. <laughs> I used to do that two years after I was saved. 
going through Buckley. Because I hadn't got my mind renewed that, hey, I'm a new creature in Christ, not the old hoodlum I used to be. <laughs> Moving right along. Okay. So Jesus is the will of God. Note, Jesus gave us mercy and grace, right? And paid our debt. He is the means by which we look at Scripture. We look into Scripture and we see what he did. We see what he's doing. And we accept him to work through us. Say amen. John 1, 1 through 4 says, In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. Notice, through him. And without him was not anything made that was made. In him was the life and the light. Life was the light to men. So let's take him and put the word. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God. And the word was God. The word was in the beginning with God. All things were made by the word. And without the word, nothing was made that was made. The word was life and the light of men. So when you value the word as much as you value God, because they're the same, because remember, Satan puts us in compartments. There's God. Oh, we're holy. But when you pick up the Bible, you know you're picking up God. Psalms 119, read it. Tonight, read it. Try to stay awake reading it. It'll tell you it's God. Over and over again. David finally found that and got his life restored. After his adultery and murdering, all that kind of stuff. Remember, he was a man. And he was an Old Testament man. God didn't dwell in him yet. All right, moving along. John, I love this. 8, 38 and 39 says, For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all that he has given me, I should lose nothing but should raise it up in the last day. Guess what? Nobody's going to pluck you out of God's hand. Amen. Because he's got to go through God. How many's ever, how, if you were like me, I remember for years people would argue over whether you're secure in God or you're once saved, always saved or not. And they would argue or, because they didn't even understand what they're talking about. You mean to tell me if your father has you as a baby in your hands, He's going to let somebody talk, talk him out of giving you away. Why do we teach such crazy man's doctrine like that? The father's not going to give you up so easily. Can you say amen? <laughs> he loves you too much. But hey, Wiggly, you can wiggle out of his hands once in a while. Moving right along. <laughs> God and Imperfect, good and perfect is God. Amen. So we know the scripture, James 1, 16 and 17. Listen. So when you're reading the word and it seems to say something that isn't perfect, what's wrong? Blame the translators. No. Your understanding of what it's saying is not quite correct yet. Remember the man that had the one talent? There was the one that had five, the one that had two, and the one that had one. What did the man think in his heart? He had wrong concepts of God. He thought a certain way, didn't have a good, clear understanding. So he was afraid of God. He hid God's money. And then God, when he showed up, he said, you could have put it at least in the bank and got some interest. But the man was so bound by fear, he hid. That's the story of what are we doing with Jesus? Are we passing him out? Or are we hiding him under our flesh? Do people see us or do they see a relationship with God? Well, the answer is, we see a relationship with God. Amen. Smile up at me. Say, that's who you are. Well, listen, you're always, your head's always going to say, well, you're not all that a good as example. So, who's, who's counting? God's living in you. Hey, let me tell you, did God come to save junk? Did he save you? Are you junk? Well, how dare you walk around thinking you're junk when God's working really, really hard to get you better? 
And the only way he can is through his word. So what do you do? You stay away from church. Somebody offended you. And I'm talking to everybody, so not, you know. Or I don't understand the word, so I'm going to sit in Sunday school. No, what? Stop using your head and be like a child. Even children drool on themselves and eat little pablum once in a while. But they still grow and they're still fed. You understand? And hey, take it from one of those pablum eating people, you know. All right, so do not be deceived, my brethren. Every good gift, every perfect gift is from above. Period, right? And comes down from the Father of lights in whom there is no variableness nor shadow of turning. Which means every good and perfect gift comes from the Father. Zip. No change. That's the way it is. Well, Pastor Kerry, in the Old Testament I see God doing things and, and dealing different ways and it seems strange to me. And in the New Testament, we see Jesus doing completely different some of the old things. So let's go through that and let's find out. Number one, is God perfect? The answer is? Yes. So all that he does concerning us is? Perfect. How he handles you and me is? Perfect. So why do we have a picture in our minds that we might not be totally cared for? Who's put that in there? Two, do not be deceived. How we look at and believe something is how we base on how we act. Act. Are you with me? So do not be deceived. How we look at and believe something is, should, is how we react to it. Amen. So if we look at something through God's eyes, we won't react the wrong way. So when I look at a new person, I don't see them as a sinner with problems. I see them as a potential champion. So when that fellow came Sunday, I saw him the way God saw him. And I could relate to him. But when we see people in categories and see people less or more than we are, we're comparing ourselves with somebody, you can see where all the confusion can come in. Say, oh me. <laughs> Do not be deceived. Notice God doesn't change. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So why, pastor, does it seem that God is perfect, deals harshly at some times, deals in the Old Testament, different things, different ways? Why do we have that? I'm glad you asked. Next point is, notice it says in point five, the seven dispensations in Scripture. Everyone say dispensation. That means same God. Is God perfect? Yes. But a dispensation is which he deals with man. So there are seven of them. They're listed there for you. Innocence. Uh, conscience, government, promise, law, grace, and millennium. Say amen. Tells you where they are. Innocence is be when God first created Adam until the time he fell, God walked and talked with Adam. There was no sin. Nothing to feel guilty for, right? But then when after he sinned, it came, became conscience. Now God had to deal with mankind through their what? Their conscience. How well did that work? Well, we find in chapter uh, 6, there were giants in the land. Chapter 8, there was a huge flood, and only eight people were saved. So conscious, man's conscience was totally corrupt. Men operated, once Noah came out of the ark, came the operation of government, where Noah and his families ruled and reigned over the earth under God. We call that dispensation of government, where God dealt very harshly, okay, with many people. Then that lasted right up at, uh, all the way through Noah, all the way up into a fellow named Abraham. Remember Abraham? Father Abraham. That <laughs> man, any slaps. Abraham was a father of promise. Amen. In fact, the promises given to Abraham in the Old Testament 
are still in operation today. He says, if we be Christ, then we are Abraham's seed. So all of the promises God promised Abraham were ours well through Christ. See, amen. So the, the dispensation of promise was from Abraham right up to Moses and the giving of the law. Then that ushered into the dispensation of the law where God dealt really harshly with man because man were all into themselves and pointed out mankind, you need a Messiah. So that lasted all the way up until Jesus was born, until the time that he died and rose again. And then we have the church age or the age of grace comes. And that's what we're in right now where God deals with us with grace. So he dealt at first, he walked with mankind. Second, he dealt with conscience, but man wouldn't listen and it was corrupted. Then he gave a government, a real right arm of strength through Noah's family. Then he gave promise to Abraham, look, it's not going to be this way much longer. I promise you a Messiah is coming. And then everybody got really full of themselves. We be God's chosen people. So God gave them the law to remind them they can't save themselves. People can get really into themselves. And then after that, they realized when Messiah came, here's what promised to Abraham. And grace was given through Jesus Christ. And then he'll go all the way up until the rapture of the church. And then there'll be seven little nasty years we call Jacob's trouble or the tribulation or Daniel's 70th week where God finishes his dealings with Israel and they fall back under seven years uh, under the dispensation of the law. And then after that's done, boom, Jesus shows up and sets up the millennial, binds the devil, binds the false prophet, Find sickness, mankind lives good old six, seven, nine hundred years again. And you and I will have our glorified bodies and under Christ, we'll be traveling all through the millennium teaching people, human beings, the gospel again. So God, same God, the same perfect God, had to deal with man, mankind through the different phases of, of their belief system so he could be fair enough to bring Messiah and then give Messiah, have Messiah die, have Messiah rise again and says, you through faith, if you accept him, I'll accept you. Can someone say amen for that wonderful thing? How did you know all that, Pastor? It's in the word. The word describes it hundreds and hundreds of times from every angle that you can imagine. So we need to be able to discern good and bad teaching. Everyone say good and bad teaching. John 10.10 10 says, The thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. So we know the word of God, when it's taught properly, will give you hope and abundance. Say hope and abundance. All right. Right teaching produces right thinking. Right thinking produces right believing. Right believing produces right acting. And God will be pleased because you'll do it in faith. Two, God's word does not contradict itself. It is Christ within us and, and down written on the page that agrees. So when we read the word of God, God in us bears witness for what we see on the page and the revelation comes to the eyes of our understanding and the spirit of God begins to take us then and walk us into those truths so they become a living reality. And thirdly, God's word builds up and encourages growth. Bad teaching questions and causes questions and questioning of God and describes God in a dark fearful, and never-knowing way. Bad teaching causes people to draw away from the very one who loves them. Religion is bad teaching. Okay. 1 John 1, 5 through 7 says, This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Can you say Amen. How much darkness? Now, if we say we have fellowship with him and walk on like a lunatic in darkness, sorry, we lie and then look at this next phrase and don't practice the truth. There are people who will tell you one thing, but they don't do it. We call them hypocrites. The Bible calls them hypocrites. 
but don't practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he's in the light, we have fellowship one with another. Why? Because God's in control of our life. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from our shortcoming. Can you say amen? A couple of points under that. Good teaching lines up with Christ and builds trust, hope, and faith. Two, bad teaching causes confusion and doubt. It causes those to reason about God instead of talking and believing him at his word. Thirdly, God's teaching develops growth and instructs us on the ways of life, while bad teaching causes mistrust, fear, and causes us to shrink back. Why? Perfect love casts out fear. Say amen. amen. You walk with God and you'll get rid of your fear. Some examples, Paul's thorn in the flesh. Oh, it was his wife. Paul's thorn in the flesh. The teaching is God gave him a thorn so it would always remind Paul to be happy. Do you know that's a false teaching? Paul's thorn in the flesh was an evil demon that Satan gave to, to Saul to tag him everywhere he went to give him trouble because of the multitude of the revelation. People teach, oh, yeah, it was his bad eyesight. Paul was beat up, so he's ugly. And they always blame the thorn on the flesh as something physical. Many ailments, many persecutions, many afflictions, this spirit stirred up everywhere he went, problems. So you bind the spirit. When Paul saw him, he says, Lord, I can't handle this. And God says, my grace is sufficient for you, Paul. Didn't I teach you how to take authority over this? Stop feeling sorry for yourself. Take authority over it. Paul was feeling sorry for himself and says, take me home. Now that's a reduced Paul to nothing when his mind is away from the word. And you probably didn't know that. So Paul's thorn in the flesh, it was a devil. It wasn't God trying to keep him humble. How about Job? What about Job? God put all that. So people use all kinds of excuses. People either believe for the bad or they're waiting for something bad to happen. Did you know you can believe for those things in negative? Don't attract problems. You're going to get enough of coming your way anyway. Don't believe for them. Oh, it's flu season. Every year about this time. Yeah, and this year, everything that sniffles, they call it COVID, so they can raise the numbers. Well, you didn't hear that from me, sorry. Anyway, so it's all a game, boys and girls. Satan is trying to run the planet, and he's crazy, and anybody who listens to the devil will act crazy like him. There won't be any substance and common sense in anything that they do, because they're listening to the suggestions of the devil. Sometimes Christians hear the devil's suggestions, and that's why what they do never comes out, because they think it's God talking to them. If God tells you to do something, it'll always work out, even if you do it wrong. Because <laughs> he already knows you from the beginning to the end, and he can move your hands or your feet and get it to work. But if you're not leaning on him, you're doing it for God, and then the enemy can have a heyday. So let's move on. All right, are you with me? Some, besides Paul, Thorne, and Job, what about the man born blind? Remember the disciples came to Jesus? So this blind man. Who did sin that this man was born blind? Was it his parents? Or was it something he did that he was born blind? No, Jesus says neither. Adam's did it. Adam put the sin on this man. Because of Adam's sin, it passed on, and this man was born blind. I must work the works of him that sent me. What did Jesus do? Reverse the problems of what Adam and the devil caused. So actually he said, neither. I'm going to work the works of God. Amen? So guess what? God doesn't put a curse on you. He's not leading you through the floods and the muds to teach you something. He's not making your bones ache because you have unforgiveness. You're doing that yourself. Hello. You see, and then we'll turn around and blame God. Hello. 
Do you know how many people are not coming to church because they think God is their problem, causing them to go through things? You got to tell them absolutely not. Every good and perfect gift comes from God. The Word of God teaches us. Let's move right along. 2 Corinthians 12, 1 through 10 talks about Paul's thorn. All right? And then 2 Timothy 3, 10 and through 12 tells that Paul got out of them all. All the problems he had, God delivered him out of them all. So if God put him in it, why is he working against himself to yank him out of it? Hey, and if sickness is a part of God's way of teaching us something, then we ought to burn down all the hospitals and, and then tell all of the nurses and everything to quit. They're going against the will of God, you see? How dumb some of that reasoning is. Remember, the devil's crazy. And he drives his point so much, so often, turn on the news, that people believe it because they don't want to fight it. They just think it's that way because everybody's saying it. Well, remember the 12 spies. The majority were wrong. Only two were right. They weren't moving around along. Some people believe for the worst. So are not knowing the truth. God wants us to he teach us what we have through his word. God allows what we allow is a false teaching. How many know that God wants us to know his word so we can resist the devil and get close to God? Amen. All right. Try the spirits, my last phrase. In 1 John 4, 1 through 7, it says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, every human, everything that says something, but test the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the spirit of God, now pay attention, even the spirit that comes, or confesses, excuse me, every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. Everyone, hold your Bible up. You have a Bible because Jesus came in the flesh. So we, when we read our word, we are literally confessing Jesus came in the flesh. There's one thing Satan doesn't do. Whether people say he does or not, he doesn't read the word. It's like fire. He can't even touch it. That's why these people don't know anybody. They throw the Bible at the devil. Because <laughs> they don't know enough to throw it with their words. Hello, use the cross, you know, and the garlic and all of these little junk things. No, you need to know the word. It says, every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ come in the flesh is of God. But every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ come in the flesh is not of God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist. Antichrist means against Christ and instead of Christ. It's an alternative, new age, man's religions. Instead of Christ, here's another solution. Take the vaccine. You don't have a virus. What is it, dear? Bacteria. It's a bacteria. So some of these things that they're making are a ploy because they found out and now countries are shutting all the vaccines down because they find out it's a virus and we've been hoodwinked. So keep studying. You heard it first. If you haven't heard it, from here. Well, we'll cut it off right there. How many here know you better be in the Word a little bit every day? Not, not so you're spiritual, but you want always the Word. Remember the Word is kind of like starting off knowing you have a full tank of gas. Okay, it's kind of like when you're building a house, you want to start off with something that's level, something that's square, something that's plumb, so that you start off right. When you're going to do some bullseye shooting or some target practice, you're not aiming for whatever. You're not shooting shotguns into the air. <laughs> you're pointing for the bullseye. The Word of God gives us the ability, with the help of the Holy Spirit and God, to focus on the bullseye of life and have our life be fulfilled. If you got something out of that tonight, give the Lord some praise.